Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Men of Ann Arbor podcast. We are still here. Michigan might not be in the NSA tournament, but we're still here recording. I am Stuart Douglas, as always, with me, Nick Stauskas. Nick, what's going on, man? Not much. Always a pleasure covering some Michigan hoops, even though it's it's the NIT. It's, it's not what we wanted, but it's honestly what we saw coming our way the entire year, somewhat. Yeah, 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 definitely. It's a... Uh... It was painful. We'll get into that. I want to shout out beyond the Big Ten real quick. I, a real story before we get into the scouting report. But I got back from work. You know, we had the live event this past weekend in Chicago. That was awesome. Um, the guy, everybody just, Kelsey, um, ET, like everybody just did a great job with the event. And I get back to work, and one of my coworkers was like, I had no idea you played at Michigan. I was, you know, listening and watching to Beyond the Big Ten. Wow. And there you were. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> really? Now, he was from Tipton and he was listening for Derek Elston. You know, he was staying loyal to the Tipton Blue Devils. But uh, okay. I thought that was pretty cool. So I want to shout out Beyond the Big Ten, everybody that uh, was a part of it from marketing to planning, um, uh, Audley, just everyone just put on a really great event and I'm excited to do it again. But let's get into the scouting report. Now everyone knows by now, Michigan's not in the tournament. Uh, the loss to Rutgers was was painful and, and it I think it caused a lot of emotion for people. I was getting into it on Twitter a little bit. I, I wasn't really getting into it, but um, you know, when these end of season things happen, it opens up fans to just unleash all of their emotions and anger um, towards the team, towards players, towards coaches. And there's been a lot of that this year, a lot of ups and downs, but we kind of, you know, what did you expect? You know, I think the expectations were a little unrealistic. I think you and me both knew, like, this was this was an uphill battle, even, even though they were playing, like, an NCAA tournament team for the entire Big Ten season. It, yeah, it was a Hail Mary um, coming into the Big Ten tournament. They needed – I felt like they pretty much needed to win the whole thing in order to, to get into it. Yeah, because Rutgers didn't even get in, and Rutgers had a better net and everything, and they didn't even get in, which – exactly. Uh, which was actually kind of wild. It yeah. was like the first time ever that I think they were picked in the matrix. 95% of brackets had Rutgers in, in the matrix wow. and they weren't selected. It was the first time ever since, I don't know how long I've been doing that, but yeah, that's wild. So they, they didn't even get in. So how was Michigan going to get in? I know. And, and just from an X's and O standpoint, like Rutgers can actually, they, they guard, which, you know, they could have maybe, you know, upset someone come tournaments. I'm not going to say they would have made a deep run or whatever, but, um, yeah. you know, I do think they maybe were deserving of, uh, of a, of a nod in, in the tournament, but yeah, for Michigan, it's one of those things where all year long, we were trying to stay positive on them. We were, we were you know, looking things glass half full. Um, they had to bring their best game to Chicago for the big 10 tournament. And instead they laid an egg, a good old fashioned egg. And um, in my opinion, that was, I mean, that was one of their worst games that they played against Rutgers. So um, unfortunate timing for them, because I think as of late, they, even though they were losing some of these, you know, tougher games that they had, um, they were at least playing well and they were competing. And this game against Rutgers uh, in the Big Ten tournament for me was just, I mean, it was, it was one of, one of their worst games of the season. It felt like Hunter was really the only guy who showed up and was ready to play. Yeah, you, you really wanted them to come through big time. I mean, I just wanted it for the kids. There's been a lot of negativity. They've Everyone's been under a microscope times 17,000. Like, I think even more than last year, um, coming off the barely getting into the tournament last year, everyone was under a microscope even more and expectations were higher. I just didn't agree with those expectations. And I'm not going to fault any fan for uh, – cheering on the team and wanting their team to win that badly where they get upset with this. Like that is what makes a lot of, especially college sports is that um, fanatic loyalty, mm -hmm. but it's, I, I really do. And I'm going to harp on this for until we're done this year, you lose your senior point guard and you have the youngest team in the big 10, I believe and one of the youngest teams in the country I don't care what four and five star talent is. I know you have Hunter there, but everyone else had not. What was the stat? It was Hunter was the only person in the team that had scored a single point in the Big Ten tournament. 
Wow. And I think some other guys maybe scored a tournament last year. He was the only person that scored in the Big Ten tournament. Now they lost to IU last year, one game. They played one game this year, but they, they just don't have postseason experience. They didn't have experience in general. That's not a knock against them. They, I saw a lot of improvement throughout the year, but the postseason's real, man. It, it, it takes a lot of veteran leadership um, and stability. And their performance against Rutgers was, you know, it was young kids that were probably with, you know, a few puckered buttholes out there, right? Like a little scared right. and nervous about messing up. And they know they need to get in. And it's one of the worst positions to be in. You always think, yeah, it's one of the um, anomalies of how we view sports. I never understand it. It's like, oh, they're, they're back, are, their backs are against the wall. They're going to fight for everything. Mm-hmm. Well, Fighting doesn't win you games, yeah. right? Like if you're fighting that hard, you want it that bad, then you're probably thinking about, I need to not screw up. I need to not screw up. And that's going to make you play worse. Like that's just pretty common sense. You see it time and time again. I understand that people want to talk about effort and energy. I'm sorry. Everyone's trying to give their best effort and their best energy. And sometimes that's not enough. Like sometimes guys still don't give enough energy and they still have stuff left in the tank. But like, that's not what you're coaching right now. Like you, you, you should be, you're, you're relying on talent. And most of all, like experience and leadership and poise, like calm nerves are are huge in the NCAA tournament. I mean, how long did it take you to get comfortable in the postseason? I'm sure freshman year, like you played well because you're a really ta- you're you're an, you're an NBA guy, you're a talented player. But I'm sure it took you a while to like get into the postseason and feel like super comfortable with everything. I'm sure that freshman year was yeah. like just your head was everywhere. I I struggled um I struggled in, in the NCAA tournament my freshman year. I had the I had one good game against Florida where I got hot yeah. and hit a bunch of threes, but other than that you look at the other five games that we played on our on our journey to the uh, to the national championship like I mean I maybe had a three here and there, but like it's not like I was coming into the games and making a huge impact. Like it was really you know, Tim, Trey, Glenn, Mitch, J Mo, Spike, like those guys, Karis, those guys were all, you know, the ones that were doing damage. Like for me, especially in the final four, there there was some nerves. There was like there was some nerves that hit me and they hit me hard. And as a shooter, sometimes it's it's oh like the worst God. thing for you because that that basket starts looking smaller and smaller and smaller after each miss. So um, but you know, with that said, I did, I did let that motivate me coming back into my sophomore year where I was like, man, I can't, I can't have that happen again on that kind of stage. Um, so again, to your point, these guys haven't had that opportunity to be motivated by, you know, a loss, um, you know, in the postseason. So, yeah. you know, for these guys, right. a lot of them, it's their first time playing, playing at this, I don't, I don't want to say at this level, but like, you know, a do or die kind of situation. Um, and it does change the game a little bit. So, um, you know, we'll see who ends up coming back next year, you know, who can redeem themselves. But, um, you know, regardless, it just, you know, they they shit the bet. There's no other way. There's no other way to put it. And and w- with expectations. It yeah, it happens. With expectations, yeah. at the end of the day, even though this team on, you know, you might look at them and they have their flaws and, you could you could argue, yeah, you, you could tell from the jump this team wasn't going to be able to really compete at the highest level. With that said, I mean, you're you're at the University of Michigan, and no matter what talent level you have on the floor, there's always going to be that expectation from the fan base, from the alumni, um, from all those people because you are wearing yeah. University of Michigan jersey. That's just that's what comes when you sign you sign with the program. So, um, you know, that's that's part of the deal. Yeah, it is. It is. And it's, you know, trying to take control of other people's thoughts, emotions, actions is impossible. So it sucks. And I want to empathize with players. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've engaged enough on Twitter to know the opinions that I don't like. And that if a player saw somebody talking about them like that or a coach, it would not feel good. Um, so you got to learn how to deal with that stuff. Not, not saying that the players aren't, but you definitely, you know, I want to empathize with them, but also say like, it is part of the deal. Like, that's just, what's going to happen. Like rationale is minimal at best in all of sports. I mean, we're all emotionally biased in so many different ways, whether we play coach or watch, it doesn't really matter. So that's just going to be a part of the game. Um, 
the I want to get into the NIT stuff and kind of transitioning into how the team is approaching it. Because I'm really proud of how they've handled it, really how they've handled all of the since Central Michigan, right? Like that was bad. It was a bad, bad loss. It was really ugly. And it's pretty much what ruined their season, if we're being honest here. I mean, they win that. They're probably in because of the way they played in the Big Ten, so that, which is an odd thing to say that it comes down to one game. But I'm really proud of the way they kept progressing. And if how I'm, if I were to be a fan of this program and view it that way, I'm legitimately proud and positive about the strides they've made, like top to bottom. And I think you know it's a little harder to see when you know you're losing games and to say like, oh well, Jawan's coaching better. But he's losing games. So how is he coaching better? Well, you got to look at the intricacies a little more detailed than that. So it's a tough conversation to have, but I, I am proud of the way that they've improved and how they're approaching this game right now. I mean, they could have easily folded. UNC is a little different. They got older guys. Like UNC was never going to play any postseason tournament. And to make those guys play a uh, postseason tournament that wasn't the NCAA tournament, I think was kind of crazy. So yeah. I'm glad that they accepted it and that they – Everything that I've seen has seemed good from the guy, from coaches' quotes, from Hunter's video. But when they're getting announced, it's probably poking fun a little bit at it. But I think he he played hard. Like everyone seems to be into it. Um, Jet might be gone. We'll talk about that. But I think I think they've they've they're doing the right things inside and also like aesthetically for the fan base. For sure, and I give them credit. I give them credit for that because I would not be on board with. Playing in the <laughs> straight up, no, straight up. No. I'd be like, "What are we doing?" But um, no, I mean, they 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 approach they're approaching things the right way, and they're young enough where it's kind of like, "Look, this is the position we're in. We didn't have a great season. Um, this is the route we got to take, and it's an experience. It's an experience for the guys that are going to be coming back next year. And now that you know opens up a whole another can, a whole whole another." Um, you know, situation with who will be returning, but you know, yeah, for those who are who for those who are returning, it's another chance to get better, another another chance to gain some minutes and gain some experience. And while as a player, it might not be what you want to hear, what you want to hear, or what you want to do. Um, you know, I'm sure Juwan and the coaching staff has thought enough about it where they think this is this the right move for them. So, yeah, it, I remember my sophomore year when Evan Turner put us out of our misery with that shot in the Big Ten tournament. And we knew that we were going to get at least a CBI invitation. And Beeline didn't even have a conversation with us. It was like, yeah, we're not playing in that. Yeah. One, NIT maybe, but like we had a bunch of seniors. And I think everyone was just completely done with the season. He was done coaching us. We were done being coached and playing. It was just a bad situation overall. And yeah, so I was more than grateful to not play in that postseason tournament. It's not everything all the time. We came back better my junior year. So it's, uh, I think it is important for this team. I mean, we were a young team back then. Shit, like we came back the next year and Zach and I were the oldest guys in the team uh, as juniors. Mm -hmm. So yes, this is good for building a team. Um, but again, like with, this could all mean nothing. With, with the transfer portal and who knows what's going to happen in the draft, Who's going to declare? Is Kobe going to test the waters or not? Uh, it's really just a crapshoot to like try to take these results and who's playing and then make a prediction about next season. I mean, I was saying last night on Twitter that, or a couple nights when they played right, uh, during the game on Twitter, that Jet basically was out, right? That the video came out of him shooting half court shots and, and he was out for his ankle. Mm -hmm. And I can get into the specifics of why he wasn't playing, even though like he probably could have played if it was an NCAA tournament game. But most likely he's gone, and it's probably not worth it to him. But who knows? Maybe he could come back uh, this next weekend or if they make it to the championship and he wants to play. Like Who knows what's going to happen? But I, I don't find it super important to be nitpicking every little thing. I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on Jet not playing? My first thought, and I've mentioned it before um, earlier this season, is in some ways they, they play better without him. And it's crazy because he, I mean, he's obviously a great player and he brings a lot to the table. But in general, when he hasn't played, I feel like the team has looked better. Grant, the Toledo, the Toledo game, you know, the, 
it's not the best team that you're playing against. So obviously guys are going to look better and perform better. Um, cause you know, I would say it's just not the same caliber as, as the big 10, but I mean, time and time again, I've, I've kind of felt like offensively, they just have more rhythm and flow when he hasn't been playing, not to say that, you know, he's not a great player. Um, but also, I don't, I don't blame him. You know, if he's set on moving forward to the NBA and being a first round pick, yeah, why would you, you know, why would you risk something with your ankle or go out there and not look your best um, when it's, it's not even the NCAA tournament? Like, I get it. You know, you want to, you want to be there with your guys, whatever, but like, this is the NIT. I honestly, if I was in his shoes, I'd, I would have probably done the same thing. I'd be like, yeah, I'm, now, granted, if I could play, I would. But if I legitimately had an injury that was bothering me and that was going to risk my stock or you know my health moving forward, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to risk it either. But this also, that this is you know, it brought me to this question, which I, I want to get your take on it. Where I feel like the NBA draft and the way prospects are evaluated has changed so much. Where like. Yeah. You look at this Michigan team and, you know, some mock drafts now have Kobe and Jet as first round picks. And while I don't disagree with that because they are very talented, I just feel like things have changed now where winning isn't valued the same as it used to be. Where like this is the this is what it comes down to. If you can't if you can't help your team win in college, how are you going to help your team win in the NBA? That's that's like, it's a very simple thing. Now, you can also make the argument, well, he's a very good piece to the puzzle. You know, Jet's a good piece of the puzzle. If you plug him in with these guys, he's going to shine and he's going to help. I, I get you can make that argument, but I just feel like the game has changed so much. And even in recent years um, with, you know, Ben Simmons and Markel Fultz being the number one pick, again, talented players and have, you know, gone on to the NBA and have done well for themselves. But they were both guys that didn't make the NCAA tournament. And then they were the number one pick in the draft. And um, I just think more and more it's the prospects are it's so selective. And it's a lot of um, I feel like a lot of it is just like the, the word on the street of like what everyone's saying on social media about some guy. And it's just like word gets behind someone, they get hot. And then all of a sudden everyone buys into like so and so being a first round pick. Um, in some ways, honestly, I would I would say I would say Kobe has looked like a better prospect than Jet has this year. But I can also you can also argue that you know Jet, you know freshman, he's long, you know he's got great size, great shot making ability, um, and that's easily translatable to the NBA. So I could see that. But um, in a lot of ways, Kobe is just he's improved so much this year where. And he's young enough where I would I, I would almost be higher on him than I than I am on Jet. Um, so I, I mean that's just my take on it. But I was rambling there for a little bit. But what do you? I mean, what are your yeah, thoughts? Yeah. On, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a God, it's a complicated conversation, right? Um, it all comes down to potential, what you're looking for. I want I want to first like say, you know, NBA teams think that especially with like good cultures, they're going to say, all right, well, we're going to get this kid. And he knows like, we're not messing around with him. Like Jet's not going to be drafted in the top five, right? The top five are guys who are going to be looked at to be more superstars. Uh -huh. Like we're going to try to give you the keys and maybe for year one, uh, like Paolo was this last year uh, or year two or three, those are the top five guys. Jet's not in there. He's going to be looked at as more of a compliment. We'll see where he turns out. And so, like, you know, I think you draft Jet, you can draft him to the end of the lottery and say, you know, depending on what team he goes to, you're going to fit in. You're going to do what we want defensively and effort-wise and and um, whatever other intangibles you want to throw out there. And if you don't play, like, then you're out of the NBA. You're not going to be on our team. It's going to look bad on you. Like, it's kind of the the – it's the end, right? Like, you you can say that in the NBA. Like, as a college coach, not as much when you have a talent like Jet Howard. Like, you, you got to play him. Mm -hmm there's only so much you can correct in one year when you get to the MA, it's like you're going to do this or your career is going to fizzle out that's up to you so i don't know i think 
a lot of times we look at a guy like Jet 6'7", can shoot it, has that spark, like has shown that ability to really fill it up. But again, it just comes down to how you want to use somebody. With Kobe, yeah, I mean, he's a, I think he's a winning type player and he's still figuring that out. I think he is a hell of a prospect. And there's bias there where he wasn't seen as that coming in. If he was, if, if Kobe was a five-star recruit coming out of high school, like, expected to start from day one this year. Let's say this is his freshman year, because technically it's his first year playing, and he's like mm-hmm. freshman year age. And if he was a five-star recruit, McDonald's All-American, he wasn't McDonald's All-American, but coming in first year, boom, you're going to start, you're going to blow up. We think you're ready for the NBA. And he had this season, he'd be gone. He'd be in sure. the lottery. Like that, like there'd be no doubt in my mind. Um, so it's always weird bias and perception game that obviously nobody's perfected because how many first-round draft picks of the Pacers <laughs> that did not work out for them. I mean, it's like comical here. You just picked a big white guy and it doesn't work out for him. So it's uh, it depends how teams view him, how he views himself. You know, that's also a long window. It's a complicated conversation. I, 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 we could talk about that, I think, for hours, to be honest with you. Yeah, I, and I, I think like more so what I was trying to say is piggybacking off you, it's it's very narrative based. I, everything in sports is narrative based, but that's what I feel like the draft comes down to. It's so much about narrative and story and getting hot at the right time. Um, so, I mean, I guess that's that's the world we live in now. But I thought it was, you know, interesting just the fact that, you know, we're in the NIT, not really competing for anything. We've kind of just been a middle of the road team all year long, and you know, we have two pretty you know, pretty good prospects in terms of potential first round picks right now. So I just, I thought it was interesting um, just to talk about that and kind of, you know, contrast our opinions. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's a, the injury talk is interesting one. He has had a nagging ankle injury. Like they sat him out. He was going to play that one game. I don't remember what game that was. The trainer came up. He was like, you're going to play it. Juwan sat him. Mm -hmm. Like he told him not to play. So, you know, if this was an NCAA tournament game, he would be playing because that would be important for a stock. NIT is just not important for your yeah. stock. It really doesn't matter. You're going to blow up in the NIT and get drafted. Right. I think he's already proven whatever he's going to prove. So I don't think, it, I mean, his heart is there. And, and, and you know, the other side of it is he, all your favorite team guys you've ever been a fan of on whatever fan, team you root for, like quote unquote team guys, those guys think selfishly too. I've always made this point and, and I'll stick by it until the day I die. The role player on the court is playing a role in, who plays major minutes. He's playing that role so he can play major minutes. It's for him. Yeah. Like he's doing that selfishly so he can play minutes. Yeah. Yes, he loves his teammates and he wants to win for the team, blah, 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 blah. But there is a selfish aspect to every single one of those players mm-hmm. on that team. I don't care if you're on the, the last guy or the first guy. So these guys, like a guy like Jet's going to get magnified more because of questionable things on defense and the fact that he's in um, a lot of lottery pick predictions. Mm -hmm. And so he's just an easy target now. Um, You know, last year it was a lot of Caleb and Musa, same thing, but also a lot more heat was on Hunter. And this year a lot less heat has been on Hunter. So – it is. It's like narrative, right? It's like you said, it's a, it carries a lot of weight um, and it's hard not to be influenced by it in one way or another. It's weird. Yeah. It's weird. Sports is weird. Talking yeah. about sports is weird. Yep. Perception, perception is always reality at the end of the day. And it's um, in this business in particular, it's hard. Once you have a certain perception, it's hard to shake it um, in good ways and bad ways. Like you, you know, yeah. You can have a good you can have a good run somewhere and then for the rest of your career you're labeled as, you know, this great player that, you know, helped the team win at this time because you had, you know, a, a good set of games and the same thing goes in the negative way where, you know, you play poorly at the wrong time or you don't defend at the right time then bam, you're labeled as this guy who can't help your team win and um it it takes a lot to be able to change that. So Again, at the end of the day, I'm I'm happy for both of these guys for for um, for Jet and Kobe. Um, you know, they're both they're both great, talented young players uh, who have good careers ahead of them, and um, we should definitely still be celebrating the fact that you know they have worked their way into potential first round NBA draft picks. Um, 
So hopefully it all works out for them. Selfishly, I would love to see, I would love to see Kobe back next year. I just think, um, I think having him and Hunter back, like we talked about this. If you could get two of those three back um, between yeah. Jet, Hunter, and Kobe, you know, I just feel, I feel like things are looking good for next season. So that's my thoughts. Yeah. Let me ask you this because I, I'm speaking to an NBA guy about the NBA draft and I have no idea what the hell I'm talking about. You know, you get your top one or two and they're supposed to be like always like the next MVP candidate. You were drafted eighth and right there solid in the lottery. And I'm curious what your mindset was going into the Kings and what their expectation from that team was at, at the eighth spot. Like, are you coming in? I know you want to be a star, right? Everybody wants to sh score, shoot, and reach their potential. Is that what they, is that what they came to you at? I mean, that, that franchise might be a little different um, at that time than some others. You know, everyone has their ups and downs. Um, but I'm curious the conversations you had in your head and then the conversations you have with staff with the coaching staff with front office and what their expectations were of everything. Well, my, it was an interesting situation. Like my agent didn't, he actually didn't let me work out for the Kings um, because he didn't want me going there. Um, <laughs> but he also couldn't deny, Correct. he couldn't deny Sacramento access to like, our agency group workout in Chicago where like all teams are yeah. invited. So he wouldn't let me go to Sacramento to work out for them, but he couldn't like shut the door on sat on the Kings and say, Hey, you're not allowed to come to our, you know, pro day workout. So the day they came, I happened to, you know, absolutely kill it. And, um, so they saw that and I knew there was, you know, maybe a small chance of me going eighth to Sacramento, but I, I honestly thought I was going to go, probably somewhere between 10 and 13. Um, so when they drafted me, I was excited because, man, you hear you, you, my name got called oh, yeah. like top 10. It was something out of a, out of a movie for me. Um, all my dreams coming true. And for me, I was so, I remember this, I was so happy. And my agent, Mark Barrowstein, he was like, not, he, you know, obviously he was happy for me, but I could see that he was like a little hesitant to like really celebrate it. And I was like, what's, he was I was like, what do you like, what's going on? What, like, why are you? And he was like, well, you know, there's going to be a lot of obstacles like Sacramento. It's been, it's been a dicey situation there for a little bit. You know, they haven't been winning. The chemistry is all, you know, kind of out of place. There's just, you know, all their recent draft picks haven't really been like panning out there. And me at the time I was 20, I was just like, come on, man, we'll figure it out. Like, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just bang some threes and like, we're going to make it work. Like that was yeah. my mindset. Um, and then, you know, quickly when I got there, I realized how chaotic it was. Like we ended up having, you know, we ended up having three coaches my rookie year. The GM who drafted That's me, wild. the GM who drafted me, he quit. And so <laughs> by like midway through the season, it was like no one that was, Everyone that was involved in bringing me there to Sacramento was no longer there. And not to mention, yeah. you look at our, like the way our roster was formed, like we, we had older veteran established players, like on paper, we were nice. Like we had Rudy Gay, DeMarcus Cousins, Darren Collison. The team had drafted Ben McElmore the year before me. Um, we had Derek Williams, the number two pick from Arizona. So like on paper, we were nice. And honestly, we weren't like super young. So I thought I was going to come in and see like all these opportunities and all these minutes because I was a top 10 pick, but they had vets yeah. that were on bigger deals. And so I honestly didn't even play much my rookie year, which kind of caught me off guard. Um, but again, that's where it's, it's different. Like, you know, those, that one to five spot, like you really are expected to come in and, you know, they're going to give you the keys in a sense where you know, we want you to be that guy for us. Um, and then after that, once you start getting to, you know, later in the lottery, um, you know, you're joining teams that typically have some established players, like the one to five picks, like those are bottom of the barrel. Like they don't have any talented players. You start going nine, 10 to 14, 15, those picks in the draft. Yeah. You know, those are teams that just missed the playoffs maybe by a game or two. And so as a young guy, you might not come in, even though you're a lottery pick, you might not come in and get these great opportunities from the jump. 
Um, but at the same time, it is good to know that, you know, a team believes in you and, you know, they, you know, they see the potential in you and you will get your opportunity at some point as a lottery pick. It just might not be right away. So that was something that I didn't understand coming in. I just thought like, bam, I'm gonna get my opportunity no matter what. And that wasn't the case. Yeah. <laughs> Three coaches and a new GM. That's a short end of the straw. They're like not only you, but everyone else, it's like, you're just fighting to survive and like yeah. does this new guy like me okay does this this new guy like me where do, what's his system oh like, it's all just mind games not, not to mention uh my last coach that we had that year george call if if george call ever hears it hears this i love you george call is a great coach great coach and he honestly uh, he was not treated fairly in sacramento um i just think by the overall team and the chemistry whatever but he came in after all-star break and coached the rest of the season. I, I don't think he ever said hi to me. I don't think he knew who I was. Um, so that sounds about, that sounds about right. So that, I that mean, sounds like a gold belt thing. And my agent told, he called me when George Carl got signed and he was like, don't take offense to this or whatever, but like George Carl has a history. Like he doesn't really play rookies that much. So like if you start getting DNPs, every night like don't take it as like oh you know i'm not a good player anymore blah 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 he was like that's just george carl and um he was never disrespectful to me but like i look back at my yeah. time there he just did not acknowledge that i existed at all so right. that was um that was a funny experience well, as a rookie he was already well past grumpy old man stage uh, he went into a different <laughs> realm at that point i love george carl i think he's great i've never met him but like hearing him talk He's talked pretty real, although he said something dumb like a couple of years ago. But anyways, yeah, he, he, that's not a fun situation for a rookie. It's just a, a weird – that was just a weird situation. But I, I want to get into more of that in the summer uh, when we record. I don't know where our schedule will be, but I want to turn into some more story time from you, get some guests on, um, get some good stories like that. So we'll, we'll table that for now. Uh, before we get out of here, we're going to get out of here pretty quick. But want to shout out to the guys against Toledo, you know, we're saying this game is like whatever, but, you know, it's still a good opportunity for them to grow, and they took advantage of it. Joey Baker, shout out Joey, 21 points, uh, one one point uh, shy of his career high, five for seven from three. Doug looked as about relaxed as I've seen him all year. This dude was shooting shooting threes, and he looked like his, his shoulders were just just like four inches just dropped. They, they were not up there by his ears. You know, he was not as nervous, and he and he came through, and he shot really well. I think four for six from three. Kobe played well. Hunter played well. Yo-Yo got in. So um, they're playing hard. They're playing well. I'm excited to watch them Saturday against Vanderbilt. We got no, we got no uh, scouting report on on Vanderbilt whatsoever. Um, but we'll be back to talk about that game. See what happens. Um, do you got you got anything else for us? I think we we pretty much. We're not going to do a scan report. I pretty much did word on campus with, with everything. What you want to talk about, we can, we can talk a little bit about before we get out of here, the Big Ten. Um, so let, let's mm -hmm. get into word on campus really quick. So let's word on campus more word for the national basketball scene in college basketball, and it's Big Ten play. You know, real quick, I'm curious. Big Ten's had a lot of struggles. Um, Izzo and Michigan State. They've really been the only ones to consistently break through for the last like 20 years. And Beeline had a, a hell of a run. And if he was there longer, it'd probably been pretty similar to that. Um, why do you think, do you think it is just the simple narrative of everyone's beating each other up? The refs, the, the, the styles are different. Is there even a reason? Is it more randomness? Like, what do you, what do you think the, the reason is for the quote unquote lack of success that the Big Ten has every year? I, I, I want to say it's complete randomness because. Again, I think year in, year out, maybe maybe not every year, but I would say 90% of the time, Big Ten is, if it's not the best conference or most loaded conference, it's it's number two or number three. Um, you know, there's a lot of great teams coming out of there every year. So you would think that it would, you know, you would think that it would happen more often where a team from the Big Ten would win. But with that said, it's not like teams from the Big Ten aren't reaching the Final Four. Like yet that's has still happened often. It's just hard to win a national championship. Like there's one team yeah. that wins at the end, and that's what you know. The NCAA tournament is the king of randomness. Like you cannot predict what is going to happen on a one-game situation. 
Um, so I, I would, I would, I would say if if it were more like NBA playoffs and we were playing, you know, three game, five game, seven game series, I would like to think the Big Ten would have a more recent champion than Michigan State. Um, but you know that that's just that's that's speculation on my part. Obviously, no one really knows the answer to it. I just I think it's random. I think the Big Ten teams. Whether it's been Michigan, Michigan State, Ohio State, Wisconsin, like there's been a Indiana, like there's just been a lot of good teams coming out of the Big Ten, and to you know, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think it is a style of play, and you think it's like the wear and tear, or I, I do think that they've got more NBA guys. Recently. Well, I don't know if I should say that. I would say possibly a lack of NBA guards, like high draft pick NBA guards. I don't, they don't usually select. Big Ten schools, but that's honestly, I could be just blowing that out my my ass. Like, I have no idea what the stats are on that. I think that might be a little bit of a part of it. I think it's a lot of randomness. It's probably a little bit of everything. Like, life usually is, right? We live in the gray at pretty much everything. So I think it's probably a little bit of that. Kevin Wheeler did have an interesting point, and it's something that somebody's brought up. Actually, I'll, I'll tell a story that uh, Andrew Terrell, uh, the Maryland podcast for Beyond the Big Ten, brought up. And it was they either won or went to the Big Ten Championship his senior year or one of his years. It doesn't matter. They went to the Big Ten Championship. Um, and then they got into the play-in game. Big Ten Championship was on Sunday. They got into the play-in game, which is on Tuesday. Good luck winning that game. Like, seriously, you you're wiped out from playing four days in a row probably they had before that. Then you get there. You're exhausted, just like emotionally spent. Then you got to recharge for after like – probably 36 hours, not even like a full 48, like prepping everything. Like you just have no time to recoup. Your, your, your tank is on E mentally and physically. That, that stuff doesn't help at all. I think, I do think that this isn't a major part of why, but I think the big 10 should stop playing on selection Sunday. I think it's dumb. And I think you can, you can get it done on Saturday and help out your teams. Um, yeah. Big time. I, it's just a weird thing. I understand ratings and money and, it's a cool thing to see to be like that um, prominent Big Ten champ or uh, conference championship at the end on a Sunday, right before Selection Sunday. But damn, that I that's I I was like that was like I never cared about like winning at all. Maybe I should have more, but I was like I'm not trying to waste my energy doing this thing that's not going to change our seating. And so we'll see. I don't know if it's going to play an effect on Purdue. Probably not. It, it's all kind of a crapshoot trying to dissect all that, like break it down to a science. Pretty much impossible, but. It's probably a little bit of everything, probably a little bit of everything and, and some beating each other up. But if you point, this is my thing with sports. Pretty much if you if you go extreme and you say it's this one reason why you're just wrong, it's 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 never one reason in anything that you do. So I can't I can't really point to one major one with that. Yeah, I, I agree. There's, you know, the sample size of 20, you know, 20 years of different coaches, players coming through a number of different programs all throughout the Big Ten. Um, obviously, a lot of great coaches and a lot of great players to just say that, you know, it's a style of play thing or this or that. You know, style of play is changing year in, year out, depending on who a coach is, who, what the recruits are. So I, I don't know. I have a tough time putting my finger on one thing specifically, but it is – you know, it is interesting because a lot of people give the Big Ten credit as maybe the best conference in college basketball. And then, you know, when you look at it that way and we haven't won in, in that long, you're like, oh, well, maybe everyone's wrong for thinking that. But I don't know. I'm yeah. I'm more on the randomness train in terms of I, I think it, it's just it's a, the NCAA tournament. You can't predict it. It's so random. It's so hard to win. That's that that's my I'm saving face here. That's that's my thought. I will say this, a couple of things before we get out of here. I think Ohio State, I'm gonna I'm sorry, Evan Turner, uh, but I think those teams should have they they should have had more success. They were <clears throat> completely built for it. And you know, so that's some randomness losing there. I think uh Purdue probably should have done more too as well with Etwan and, and Robbie and Jawan. Um so I think there's a little bit of underachieving randomness there that happens with it. Oh man, I just I just lost next thought. Oh no, it was it was my best thought too. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a little bit a little bit underachieving there. Damn it. It was good. It was gonna end the show perfectly, Nick. 
Well, I, I'm going to think of it right when we, right when we cross. Get back on the train. Two seconds. Yeah, I don't know. I got I got nothing for it. Um, but we'll be back. Uh, they play Vanderbilt in Nashville. Try to convince Chelsea to go, but it's a 12 noon start Saturday, so I'm probably not going to make that trip down to Nashville. But uh, that, w- that would be a lot of fun for like a one-day road trip. But uh, they play Saturday. I'm tuning in. We'll be back. I don't know when we're going to record again. Um, see what happens. Follow them along the anti- NIT tournament. Um, but I like the way they're playing. They're, they look fun. They look like they're having fun. They're loose. And I'm just going to enjoy the entertainment of it all, not try to dig too deep on everything. Um, you got any, any final thoughts before we get out of here? If you're showing up, you might as well win. You know what I mean? At the end yeah, of the day, if you're no. there, if you are you got your ankles taped, you got your jersey on, you might let the competition get the best of you and you might as well win. So it's not the prize you want in an NIT championship, but if you're there, make the most of it. I remembered. I remember my final point on the Big Ten. It is that I think <laughs> David, David says, tune in next week for Stu's thought. No, I remembered it. <laughs> I think that sometimes... I might be biased here because I thought we got screwed out of a seating. Like they respect the big 10. So they'll put a lot of teams in, but I don't know if they give the proper seeds. Mm. Like they're like, okay, well, instead of a four, there'll be a five. Like we don't really like their stats. And it's like, well, which one is it? Like, is it our stats is our efficiency, our net rating, our wins and losses. Like, the talent, I, I know nobody believed in our my talent my senior year, even though we tied for a share of the Big Ten title. But I thought we got screwed there, and I obviously think we got screwed because we lost to Ohio, even though that Ohio team was – they almost beat mm. the that national champ that year. So, uh, bias thought from Stuart to finish out the episode, but I do think that might be a play a part there. I, I'll be something I'll have to keep track of. I'm going to have to do some research there. But uh, appreciate everybody listening and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, subscribe on YouTube at Beyond the Big Ten. That is Beyond the Big Ten. Ten is one zero. Um, comment, subscribe, rate us. Give us your questions. I'm loving all the engagement on Twitter. Nick, you still aren't missing anything, but we appreciate you guys listening. We'll be back next week. See you later. Beyond the Big Ten is a network of podcasts that aims to be your go-to resource for all things Big Ten. We cover the entire conference with shows hosted by ex-players and athletic alumni, aiming to be your go-to source of information and entertainment for your favorite team. Hosted by ex-Big Ten players, media, and insiders, our podcasts are focused on giving diehard fans and those alums an inside scoop about the teams and people that make the Big Ten Conference one of the most watched and most talked about conferences in sports. We're excited to talk Big Ten basketball with you wherever you may be. Subscribe now.